Welcome to this installment of Creative Cabin Fever. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. He is actually my comedy rival. We have many, many years of knowing each other through many incarnations on both our parts. Welcome, Stephen Stubbs. Hello, Rebecca. Uh, thanks very much for having me on your show. Um, it's a sincere pleasure and a sensation, and it's great to be here. And uh, well done for everything you're doing during this, these, these strange and unusual times. It's good for people to connect, and that's what you're doing. And um, it's what I'm doing as well in my various uh, different broadcasts, which we'll talk about imminent, imminently. <laughs> but no, uh, thanks. Yeah, it's great to be here. And it's brilliant to have you. I have actually been spending a lot of time with you over the last pandemic time, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Wednesdays and Saturdays are pretty much consumed by you, to be honest. I feel like we're dating. It's kind of nice. Well, vir virtually, virtually. Um, <laughs> but we are many, many miles apart. Um, my uh, precise location is not, is, is not really dis disclosed to my, to my viewers. You need to keep a distance, you know at all times, uh, I think, from the real people. Um, but no, I'm joking, of course. Yes, you, I think you're referring to my quiz cast. Yes, um, they say a game show host is the last refuge of a scoundrel. And I suppose that's why I've, I've taken to um, hosting quizzes online, like a fish to water, or a duck to water, in fact. Um, well, fish and, fish and ducks take to water very well. Um, so what I'm saying is, yeah, uh, um, if we're, let's talk about the quiz cast. So basically, um, luckily for me, I have been doing a live broadcasting for about two or three years now, long before the pandemic broke out, uh, usually to an audience of one or two people um, <laughs> on my various pages. And um, so I always had a feeling that someday multi-camera uh, Facebook live streaming will become very popular. Now, unfortunately, it's taken a worldwide pandemic, a once in a century pandemic, for it to uh, find its niche, but to, f to fully find its, 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 its whatever it is. But it's happened, and um, it's not just quiz cast, it's not just quizzes, it's, 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 it's Zoom calls. Um, it is, um, you know, it's families getting together from different parts of the world talking. It's, it's, it's music, there's bands playing online, online now, doing gigs. And, um, I remember trying to persuade bands to go live on, on Facebook um, um, because it, it's, it, was a, it was a great way to directly uh, um, connect with your fans. When you can actually talk to your fans in real time, not in some pre-recorded video. As you might know, we made a show um, called Make Some Noise about a year ago, I think. And before that, of course, with Eddie Blake, was uh, Live at the Loft. So when me and Eddie were trying to persuade bands back then, they were unsure as to what we were talking about because that's two years ago, I think, was Live at the Loft, still available on, on, on Viking Promotions page, I believe. Yeah, all the episodes. Yes, I think. yes it yeah. is. Absolutely. So that was pretty much, as far as I know, that was Live at the Loft, was Ireland's first multi-camera um, amateur music show, shall we say, broadcast live every Saturday. Okay, I'm saying amateur, because the bands weren't amateur, they're mostly all proper jobbing bands. Um, but, uh, but it wasn't RT or TV3 or whatever. It was basically me and Eddie Blake and Frank Whelan. Hello, Frank out there. Hello, Frank, you're a legend. So basically, the three of us really, um, we just, you know, made our own little uh, music show. It was great. We were able to almost commission ourselves. Um, to, to make our own uh, music show, and Eddie Blake had a Eddie Blake had a never-ending supply of bands. You know, Eddie was he knew how to find bands, which was great. And because I, di I didn't really know, I know I know bands around town, but I didn't really know the bands he knew all over the country. We had bands coming from all over the the, the thirty-two counties. Um, you know, and some bands who kind of, who kind of really developed into like um, you know lots of bands. <laughs> I try to remember now. But uh, I'm sure, uh, if you look back on the Viking promotion page, let's see. The Wah, the Wah, remember the Wah? The Wah were yeah. one of the first bands. The Wah are now huge. They were really getting big before the pandemic, so hopefully they will take up after that. But they're an amazing band. The Wah are one of the most impressive live bands I've seen, and they're all in the early 20s at the most. So they must have been teenagers when they were on, on our show, you know. Um, they were great. Lithium Lounge, Ronit, you know, great band. 
Um, so, you know, obviously, but, uh, you know, name some of the bands that run. You, you were there. You were watching the episodes. I was um, watching from home. I was watching from home, but I also had a very small baby at the time, so my memory's not I, quite there. <laughs> I know. Sleep deprivation does that. <laughs> it does. It does. Yeah, no, I remember thinking that was a great idea, kind of having something so local, allowing people access to music. And I agree with you completely. I've also been trying to convince bands there is this free technology out there that will get you more viewers, more people interested in what you're doing. Why aren't you using it? And it's just because it's misunderstood, I think. It's like, we could be having all these conversations and you're right, for me to do what I'm doing right now, the pandemic is the only reason it's even getting the attention that it probably should have been getting all along, like between the podcast that I do and the interviews that I do at every Viking show. Do you know, it's yeah. only now that- oh, No, well, yeah. I wouldn't say it's the only reason it's getting so many views but i mean you know obviously i think you're you're creating a lot more content than you i think you were previously i think unless i was missing but you know you're definitely creating more content since um the lockdown began anyway um but you know this is the way the world was going the world was going increasingly online and this is the way history moves history you know they say someone said nothing happens forever and then in a minute everything changes you know so that's kind of what's happening. What's happening now is everything is changing. There'll be long-term, there'll be long-term consequences to what's happening now with the, the, the pandemic. Even though it'll, you know, within the next year or two, things will go back to kind of semi-normal. It's going to be huge changes, whether it's the world of entertainment, online entertainment like this, or whether it's even, even what's happening in America right now. Basically, their economy is being socialized. This is something socialists in America have dreamed about, dreamt about for 100 years. It was, and it, it took a major tragedy for basically what's happening is the government is giving free money to people. This is unheard of in America, you know. So what I'm saying is, in a few months' time, if the American government says, you know what, we're not giving you free money anymore, um, or basically a, 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 a universal income is not on the table anymore, it'll be uproar because they can see when the, when the government really wants it to do it, they can suddenly create money out of nothing, you know. So... A universal income might be the long-term consequence in America anyway. There's already one in Ireland and in the UK. There's a pretty much a minimum wage and stuff. But what I'm saying is these are the kind of long-term consequences of what's happening around the world. But I don't think we want to talk about economic theory, do we? <laughs> I mean, I find it particularly interesting. I find you to be particularly interesting. This is your show. This is to showcase your beautiful brand of magic. So it is a very interesting thing to talk about for sure. It's up to you what we talk about. But you're right. It's okay. funny, isn't it? How the world changed overnight and people started realizing that the things that they believed to be the way, actually the way might be more than just one way. Well, nothing lasts forever. The world is, is constantly in flux. This is something I often tell people when they're down the dumps about things uh, and they think, uh, you know, that they can't see any light at the end of the tunnel. I always say, just wait. All you have to do in life is wait. <laughs> and things get better. Believe me, I've been through some tough times, but you just wait, you just kind of wait out the storm and things pretty much always get better. Now, if obviously, if you're in a, I don't know, if you're in a medieval dungeon somewhere in, you know, 1126, you know, you're not going to escape that dungeon from heresy or something. You're, you're pretty much going to have a horrible, miserable end to your life. But what I'm saying is, if you're not in a dungeon with no hope of escape, usually there is a light at the end of the tunnel in almost any situation. Um, and you never, know, you never know what's around the corner as well. <laughs> you never know what's around the corner, good, good and bad. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, who would have known six, three months ago? Like, I began... Um, I actually went off on my world travels literally the week, probably the week the Wuhan virus first became um, a thing in the, in the national media, which was kind of late December, I think. Um, I was actually just beginning my world travels. I was in Vietnam, I think. Vietnam, Australia, and so on and so on. So it's, it's hard to believe even three months ago, you could just travel the world blithely rambling from city from country to country without any consequences you know you weren't even being checked at the airports apart from you know, passports and stuff you know now it's completely different you know now to, now to go somewhere to go anywhere is a major ordeal it's not probably not even possible to go anywhere at the moment i mean there is flights you know there's there is still plenty of flights happening all over the world um that's something i'm interested in, that I'm, I'm really surprised flights haven't been shut down 
because that is the way, um, that's how people, that's how viruses travel from one country to the next, in the early stages anyway. It was by airplane, pretty much airplanes. Um, so it is amazing how things can change so rapidly. But look, the world's been through a lot worse. This is something I'm constantly saying. Um, think about it. We're the first generation, probably, well, probably the second generation, to have lived in a time with no world war, right? If you think, if you think the coronavirus is bad, <laughs> uh, try a world war, okay? 60 million people dying violently, okay? Violently, which is not a good way to die. Um, and that happened only 70 years ago. Um, so you know, there's, been, there's been many, many wars since then. But what I'm saying is there hasn't been a world war. There hasn't been a nuclear war. You know, we've, we've been very close to a nuclear war a couple of times. Um, I think one of, the great, one, of the great, one of the great things that's happened in the last 40 years was, was the end of the Cold War. Because that was, I grew up in the 80s. And literally, I remember lying in bed at night um, um, just thinking about nuclear war constantly. <laughs> And um, that was, yeah, like all the films in the 80s, you know, it was were off, like war games and like even the Goonies and stuff. There's always references to the nuclear war about to happen at any moment. Red Dawn, Pat Patrick Swayze, you know, it was just this constant thing that at any moment, the entire world could explode, basically. And there's nothing you can do about it. We had no control over it. Basically, like two groups of men sitting in the Kremlin or the White House can suddenly decide on a whim, let's, let's bring the world to an end, you know. So that's outrageous. And so it's great that that threat has kind of ebbed. It's not completely finished, but it pretty much is because it just, it just is. Because uh, I won't go into the details of why it is, but it, it, we're not quite on, we're not on the brink of, of, of um, apocalypse as we used to be, you know? And we've been through pandemics before. The Spanish flu is taking a very, people should watch or read about the, the Spanish flu, 1918 to about 1920. Was the, was the height of it, anyway. It actually continue, continued on until the in 1950s in a very small way. But those two years after 1918, um, up to 50 million people died around the world. And there was no really effective treatment ever found for it, really, that particular uh, brand of flu, the Spanish flu. And um, once again, that was born of consequences. Like, at the moment, people are blaming coronavirus on the uh, wet markets of China. Okay, where you have all these different exotic animals who would never meet in the wild. This is the thing. These animals will never meet in the wild. A bat will never meet with a pangolin up close and personal, right? But in the wet markets, a pangolin, a bat can go for a poo and a pangolin can eat it, apparently. And then he gets to whatever disease the bat has. Okay, now, the reason for the Spanish flu in 1918 was loads of American soldiers going to Europe. Thousands and thousands of American soldiers went to Europe in 1917. Okay, they'd never been to Europe before. People, like hundreds of thousands of Americans, didn't go to Europe every year in the early 20th century. Did you know? Did you, did you know? There wasn't tourism back then. Okay, so apparently a, a farm boy from Kansas, and he was Kansas. He caught basically a swine flu from the pigs on his farm. Then he was enlisted in the army. He was um, much called um, drafted into the army in 1917. He went to Europe, to the trenches, carrying this new form of swine flu, which he didn't even know he had. And he then gave it to British soldiers and French soldiers who had no immunity and had never come across. This might have been a flu that went around America for many, many decades. But the European soldiers had no, um, had no immunity to it. And basically it morphed into a brand new flu. Called, they called it the Spanish flu, but actually it actually came from America, interestingly. The reason it's called a Spanish flu is because the Spanish, remember, during the time of World War I, there was um, censorship. There was censorship in America and Europe. So um, um, basically, information was tightly regulated. So by, 19, by the middle of 1918, thousands of soldiers were dying in the trenches from this new flu. Thousands and thousands, right? So the Allies didn't want the Germans knowing about it. Now, the Germans were dying as well. They didn't want the Allies knowing about it. So Spain was neutral. Spain was neutral in World War I and World War II, interestingly. Right? So Spain had a free press. So Spain basically published there's, a, there's this horrible flu that's killing thousands of soldiers all around Europe right now. And because of that, it was called a Spanish flu because the Spanish basically got the news out. But it has nothing to do with Spain. 
And then over the next 18 months, two years, it spread all over the world. So start from the trenches of the World War I, all over the world, 50 million dead. And it's very similar. Even the photographs, if you type in Spanish flu photographs, you'll see these makeshift hospitals they built in major cities. Pittsburgh was hit really bad. Pittsburgh was really wiped out, or Philadelphia, I think. Um, they built these temporary hospitals just for flu patients. And that's exactly what's happening now. They're building field hospitals in Central Park in New York, which is, you know, really like something from a, you know, um, a, um, a disaster movie, you know. But anyway, we'll get through it. Of course we will. I actually saw a picture today and it was the end of the war where loads of people gathered in the streets. And because mm. the epidemic was still so ongoing, there was actually more deaths caused directly by people celebrating the war being over than the war itself. And I just went, yeah. I'm staying home. That's it. Unfortunately, mass gatherings are not a good idea in the middle of a pandemic. But you see, they were helpless back then. They didn't even know what it was back then, you see. I mean, we all have access to information in real time. Back then, different countries just didn't get the information the way we do, you know. So... Yeah, I mean, there's some, there's, some, there's some fascinating statistics from America during the Spanish flu, where, like, let's say one city held a parade for Paddy's Day or something, you know, and that city was hit hard then. But another city which didn't have a parade was, was not too bad. So, yeah, mass gatherings are not, are not good. Uh, so that's why I don't think we'll see any mass gatherings, at concerts, or until at least the end of the year, I'd say, maybe. It's just too risky. Maybe. I don't know. Hmm. I don't either. I guess we'll have to see because, as you said, there's more information available to our generation and we just don't know what kind of breakthroughs may or may not happen in the next while. Yeah. I mean, there'll be, there'll be, there'll be some kind of vaccine within the next year and a half, maybe. But it's, it, it's, it's not imminent. It's not imminent. It's not, I don't think it's this year, you know. So we just have to learn to live with it, really. Um, now, many of us, you see, another thing is uh, many of us have had it already. We just don't know we've had it. The vast, the 96 percent of people would probably have it. I never know. Um, so whether whether that means you're immune, they're not quite sure yet if that means you're immune to it. There are new, unfortunately, in South Korea have said at least two hundred people. I think have gotten it again. They got it and got it again. You know. Um, so, but look, at the, as I said, it's. We're not being bombed. We're not, there's not like a German or Russian aircraft overhead dropping bombs on us. You know, basically just told to stay home and watch Netflix and uh, Zoom to each other and maybe a bit of, uh, bit of racy texting now and then. But that's pretty much it. Like, you know what I mean? So it's not too bad after all, you know. Now, luckily, and, and, you know, I'm, I have the luxury of saying that I haven't been sick myself. So I don't, I don't, I haven't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I had it anyway, yes. But maybe, who knows? We don't, we don't know. We might have had it. We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. And so. you're right. Like, it's very rare for us to be in a situation, like, realistically, as a nation, we're basically told to sit on our couch and enjoy our times in our houses. So that gives us the opportunity for self-work, yes. inner <laughs> thinkings, relaxation, to concentrate on creative projects that we might have ideas for to potentially save for new ideas, to really contemplate what we want out of life when we no longer have this. It's kind of a beautiful blessing if harnessed mm. correctly, but that's life in general. It's what you make of it, not what happens. Yeah, make the best of it. That's what I'm trying to tell people. Now, obviously it's easier if you're, <laughs> as, a, as a single bohemian wastrel like myself, it's quite easy for me to tell people to, to cheer up, okay? I don't have, I mean, if I had three or four screaming children around me all day long who should be in school, um, or, you know, I mean, um, or if I had a husband or a wife who was basically losing their income, I would obviously, that would be a nightmare. So it's easier, it's, I mean, you know, I'm a lucky position that, I, you know, my life hasn't really changed much at all, <laughs> to be honest. So, but there are hundreds, millions of people whose lives have been turned upside down and they can't understand, Jesus, I'm sitting home all day? Like, what the fuck am I meant to do? You know, um, like it's, but look, at the same time, uh, I know many people who say who have always complained about having not, they don't have enough time with their children, or they don't have enough time to watch the box sets, or read, their, read novels, or learn a piano. Okay, so I'm telling people, now's your chance. 
the government will never again, in, in our lives, the government will never again say, stay home and practice your hobbies and will actually pay you for it as well. Okay? Believe me, this is a once in a lifetime event. Um, so you have to look for the best of it, the best in it. Now, some people will be probably throwing their tomatoes at the screen when I say that because it sounds like I'm being way too um, uh, optimistic, or as in like, but I'm seeing the half glass full rather than empty. Is it? Yeah. Uh, it is pretty, it is half empty. So, no, but what, you know, but it, it's, it, it's, you know, there are certain jobs that need to be done. So, uh, bus drivers, bus drivers should be given a medal, I think. I was chatting to the, the Tramor bus driver there last week. Um, and you know they were given you know he I was saying to them you guys should be wearing masks you know you're, you're, you're seeing so many people every day um, like people like that and healthcare workers they should be given medals you know because they can't they can't stay in bed and watch Netflix they have to go out and make the world go around you know and shopkeepers no one ever really realized that people who work in shops are super important yeah shop yeah absolutely you know, our humble little centres and stuff, which are still open, and spars, you know, uh, our Aldi's, super values, they're all still open pretty much. All those workers, you know, they, 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 they don't, they, they, they could, they're, they're, you know, they're coming across, they're coming into contact with people way more than me and you will. So, so let's, once again, as, as I was saying earlier, we, we will see a slightly, we will see a long-term consequence, hopefully, of all this, is a reevaluation of essential jobs okay what's what's an essential job and what's not um so now we're suddenly we're still we're suddenly discovering a nurse is an essential job and a, a shop a, a person working in aldi is essential is an essential job to keep civilization going you know so hopefully that means that will mean eventually they get paid better at the end of the day you know we can give them medals but let's just give them some extra money in their wages as well which would be nice. That would be nice. But yeah. what I'm really proud of you for is the reinvention of your creativity in this time. And I do agree with everything you've said so far. But effectively, we're here to talk about the reinvention of your creativity and also to make people discover how clever and smart you are, which I think you've managed to do all by yourself by that conversation. You're so kind. You're so kind. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I don't know uh, the reinvention of my creativity. Uh, well, it's it's definitely uh, picked up a pace. You know, I've always been cursed or blessed with the creative urge. Um, uh, now that doesn't it doesn't really lead to a very stable lifestyle, as in financially. But I don't really care about that that too much. And um, I'd rather I'd rather be um, creative. Um, I'd rather be creative and happy rather than wealthy and not happy, you know. If I can be both, even better. <laughs> so, um, no, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, I just, look, luckily for me, I don't need much money to make, you've seen my stuff. Um, it doesn't require a, bit, a big budget, really, to churn out my content, um, you know, or talk, you know. Uh, so, I'm not really making Hollywood movies around like that. So, it's easy. And uh, Facebook, you know, Facebook is, gets, gets a lot of, lots of abuse. Um, and it's, there are some very nasty um, parts of Facebook and aspects of it, which I don't like. But for me, it's just, it's a TV station. Facebook is a, t a TV station, the biggest social media experiment uh, that's ever happened. Um, it's a way for people like me and you to get stuff out there, create stuff and put it out there and see how it flies or doesn't fly. And if it doesn't, who cares? You know, um, it's just, a, yeah, it's great. You know, um, it's it's because in the, I grew up. I grew up before internet, right? Um, so I remember how hard it was to get your content out there. Because I was always into films and TV and videos and stuff. You know, I remember shooting stuff on camcorders back in the nineties, in the early nineties, shooting little films on camcorders with my 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 friends who were actors. Well, they thought they were actors, but um, and I remember how do I, like how do I get people to see this? And carrying VHS tapes around people's houses and going, please watch this VHS tape of this short film we made. So when YouTube came along and all that kind of stuff, um, it was mind-boggling. Now, um, now I didn't really get into YouTube that much. Now, in hindsight, 
I should have been into YouTube a lot more in the mid noughties. I think 2005 it started off. You know, so I should have been on that. I should have been on that. But I was actually in college in Dublin, having way too much fun. So I, I wasn't really, I had no time for, um, oops. You sorry. disappeared, but you're back, you're back. I need, I need to plug, plug my iPad in for a sec. Okay, I'll just pause this for a sec, will I? Oh no, you're yeah. okay. You're going fast, you're doing fine. So you were in college having way too fun. I'll just recap. <laughs> um, so you yeah. missed out on the birthing of YouTube effectively, but you learned a lot from being... Uh, well, no, I, I was aware. Okay. Yeah, I was obviously I was aware of YouTube. I was aware of YouTube, but uh, I was basically in, in film college in Dublin, in Ballyfermot College. So for me, my life was basically film, film, film. Like, we're literally talking 16 millimeter film, 35 millimeter film, you know. So for me, shooting little silly videos on YouTube wasn't really what I wanted to do. I wanted to make movies, you know, which is my main passion, I suppose, is movies. Well, watching movies anyway. So, um, yeah, it, I just didn't really see, I didn't really see, um, I didn't really see the comedy, the, the comedy, like the early days of YouTube was basically just, was mostly, it wasn't that much, it wasn't much high-end content on it. It was basically lots of uh, cat videos, and it still is. Cat videos and people just maybe, I don't know, just talking like a, like a one hour demonstration on, on, I don't know, deck chair assembly or something. It was really weird. It was very odd. The early days of YouTube, people didn't really know how to use it properly. You know, they didn't see the, they didn't see the, the, um, the potential of it, you know. So I, didn't, I, I was thinking, yeah, that's great, but it's not really, that's not like high end movie making that I want to do, you know. So I kind of ignored it, I ignored it till, I don't know, 2010, 2011. And then it was kind of too late for, you know, it's, it, it, if you were in there at the early days, building your subscriber base, it was re a really clever thing to do. And, um, you know, but so yeah, YouTube, I've never been really into, but then when Facebook came along, I thought Facebook's better to reach people. Um, especially when Facebook Live, I have four years now since Facebook Live was launched. And that's when I really kind of, um reinvented myself as as you said um yeah there was other stuff happening in my 30s where i was I, I wasn't really involved in creative stuff anyway i was just busy living actual life so um so about four years ago i saw immediately facebook live was launched i, was, I immediately said that is going to be a tv station basically that's going to be that will be turned into a local tv station each city and town in ireland or america or whatever would basically have their own little facebook show like water from your pocket you know, um, and for someone like me, I was thinking, oh, I could, just, I, I want to do my own chat show. So let's just create a chat show where I talk to um, made-up guests because I, ra I rather do comedy than real stuff, really. Um, and I, I basically did a thing called Arts Talk. I think it was, yeah, Arts Talk. Where's all my Arts Talk fans at? <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, that will return. That will return. That will return someday soon. I'm working on plans for the rest of this year for multiple multiple uh, shows once uh, current circumstances change and I can move somewhere else. Um, so, yeah, so our stock was basically a spoof chat show that I broadcast from my studio, which was um, which is now Water Film Center in the forum, up the top of the forum there in uh, the Glen, the Glen in Waterford. So yeah, so chat shows, um, surreal comedy stuff, um, and then eventually uh, trivia shows, quiz casts, you know. But it's not just it's not just uh, the quiz cast kind of came out of uh, actual quizzes I was hosting. Um, I was hosting actual quizzes last year in Downs's Pub in Waterford City, which are kind of similar to the quiz casts I'm doing now on Stubhood Media, but I was doing them live. Um, in Downs' uh, fundraiser for the Water Film Center. So uh, I enjoyed that so much. You know, I actually loved, I really enjoyed doing that. Every two months, I think I did one. And um, that was a real pleasure because you can, you can, I wasn't just like, you know, coming up with questions. It was coming up with concepts, you know. Um, you know, it, it was creative. I realized creating your, making your own quiz is actually a very creative process if you want to do it uh, the way I do anyway. Um, like we used to, I used to do one where, uh, around where um, we play you take the music from one scene and put it over the scene, of, let's say like a scene from, um, from Scarface, Al Pacino, right? You pick a very fa famous scene from that, but you put the music from 
a scene from Go- The Godfather or something over it, or Jurassic Park, you know? So I'd, I'd say to the people, name the film and the soundtrack, as in it was kind of, um, never mind. But the point is... a medley uh, of films. medley. Allowing yeah, basically... people to have the oral pleasure and the visual pleasure and try to decipher which was which world. That's a very exactly. interesting concept. That's what I was trying to say, Rebecca. <laughs> yeah, you said, you said it. Just press pause for one second. Okay. Yeah. I think... So we had a battery malfunction, okay. which happens with these things. But we were talking, obviously, for everyone else, about the pub quizzes and how you're able to make everything that you touch creative, really. That's a gift in itself. You just have this ability to just be creative in everything you do. And I find that fascinating about you, Stephen. But a lot of people out there might only know you from the local stuff and they might not know your journey. So would you like to talk to us about where you came from and, and how you ended up here? Oh, yes. Um, thank you. Before I, uh, yes, uh, b- before I became the well-known uh, Waterford City eccentric and um, personality, I actually had a, a kind of a slightly more lugubrious career up in the capital of Dublin City, as they call it, Duvlin, the Blackpool. And um, <laughs> yeah, so basically what happened to me was I went to, um, after I left school, um, I had a very poor leaving certificate because I didn't really study for my exams. And I discovered Budweiser and so on, and ladies and stuff like that. And uh, just didn't really have much interest in school really, apart from history and English and art, history, English, art. Um, and I wish I'd done music as well. We, I, I, we didn't have the option between, I, don't, I think we had to choose history or music. I think it was one or the other, and I chose history. Um, so my, my music career happened much, much later in my life. Um, but anyway, so after school, I did a false course down in Tralee called Video Production. And that was a fantastic course um, because we were just given all the tools to make videos. Um, and that was kind of mostly like local TV stuff, local news reports. We'd be sent out into the field or literally in a field, some most times in Tralee, and uh, interview people, Vox Pops, as they're called in the industry. Vox Pops. Um, and we learned to edit. That was 19, late 90s, so it was basically tape. It was the tape editing. Basically cutting tape, not, not physically cutting it, but cutting tape in a kind of a editing machine where you have these kind of uh, things you twirl like that. So it was quite um, laborious even back then, but... Um, it taught you how to edit, basically. It gave you a bit of discipline in, in editing. And, um, and then after that, I went and did a film course in, um, there's years in between, which I won't go into, but anyway, basically by the early noughties, I went to film, I did film, full-blown film, because film director is what I wanted to be since I was a little fella. Well, I wanted to be two things. I wanted to be an archeologist. Well, it came from the same film. From watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, I wanted to be a filmmaker and an archeologist, okay? Just from watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is one of my top favorite, one of my favorite films, total masterpiece, Raiders of the Lost Ark to this day. Um, so I didn't realize you have to go to college for like five years to be an archaeologist, and you need a lot of really good uh, points in your even cert. So I didn't have that option. So luckily for me, there was a College of Further Ed- Education in Bally Fermers that has a brilliant uh, film course that I recommend to anybody who maybe has a good portfolio, but terrible uh, leaving start results, um, I recommend Bally Fermat College. Um, it's also got an amazing school of rock, the rock school, literally, uh, like Jack Black, uh, Dustin Jeep's chair, but it's very similar. And um, a lot of great bands have gone through the school of rock and Bally Fermat. A lot of great filmmakers have gone through the film college. And Neil Jordan went to Bally Fermat Film School, as far as I remember, and a few other people. Um, so, a new uh, Waterford filmmaker, James Fitzgerald, who's really talented. Um, he's got a film coming out soon called Invis- Invisible Boy. Um, he went to Bally Fermat for a while as well. So what I'm saying is I went there to learn film the old-fashioned way. Okay, we literally used Steinbeck, Steinbeck editing machines from World War II. They were like 80 years old, these things, 70 years old, where you, where you literally cut the film. Um, with a little kind of a cutter thing, and then you set a tape it together, uh, you, you create what's called a rough assembly, a rough assembly. And then when you're, finished, you know, when you're finished with your cuts and you're happy, you literally have to write down the sprockets 
each each frame of film has sprockets that are numbered, like 125 for frames. Okay, so you literally have to write down where the cuts are, and that's all sent off to the laboratory in England because we didn't have, we didn't have a lab in, in Ireland back in the early noughties. Uh, even then, there was no more labs left. So you have to send your film with all the instructions to a lab in England, and that's they would assemble it. They, they would assemble final cut from the negative, the master negative. So anyway, <laughs> that was how laborious it was to make movies in the old days. But that's how we learned. Now, we didn't have to learn like that. Even in 2002, when I was in college, we didn't have to learn like that. There was a, even then, we could do it in a more uh, um, technically advanced way. But our teachers wanted us to learn that way because it, it learned, you learned how to, you learned discipline, right? You're given a 10 minute reel of film that costs about 200 quid and that's it, right? You're not given six hours of footage to mess around with. Like nowadays you can film indefinitely, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a hard disk, it's a whatever, memory card. You just film and film and film and film and you end up with thousands of hours of footage. So it was good to learn when you had like te a precious 10 minute reel of film. You couldn't waste a second on it. You had to plan things really well, storyboard stuff. I'm a big believer in storyboarding uh, for filmmaking. Like Spielberg storyboards everything. His entire film is like a comic book before it's even shot, you know? And not all filmmakers do that, but I, I think that's a good way to go. Um, especially in anything involving action, you're shooting action scenes, a storyboard works so much better. Otherwise, it's very hard to do complex scenes with no storyboard. Um, anyway, so by the mid-90s, I graduated from that college and I set up a production company with a friend of mine, Ray, uh, Ray Sullivan, who's a brilliant visual effects artist up in Dublin there. And we set up a little um, production company just dedicated to making comedy and science fiction. That's all we wanted to do. Our two favorite things, comedy, science fiction, right? me and Ray, and um, we just started making little uh, trailers and, you know, concept pieces, uh, proof of concept it's called nowadays, and we just send it off to RT or film, you know, production companies say, here's our idea, here's what it might look like with a proper, wait, well, no, here's what it looks like with, a, with no budget, you know, because Ray could make stuff look incredible, you know. Um, so that was good, we were a pretty good team, and then eventually we got, uh, I, was, I was obsessed with sitcoms in the mid noughties I was obsessed with Seinfeld and Arrested Development, and I just wanted to make my own sitcom. RTE had no, RTE had no sitcom of its own in the mid noughties I think Killing the Scully was, was, was just before or after that. But basically it had no sitcom. So I was thinking, I was saying, Ray, let's pitch a sitcom to RTE. It's a gap in the market. I love sitcoms, I, I, would, I know how to write sitcoms, well I, I thought I did, <laughs> and I wrote basically a six, a six episode season, and it was called The Roaring Twenties, about a bunch of people in their twenties having a roaring good time, um, and it was about, see that was the middle of the Celtic Tiger, we're talking 2005, 2006, it was the middle of the Celtic Tiger, everyone was rich, having great times, but not us, not us artists, we weren't, okay, we still weren't fucking rich and driving around in nice cars. So the sitcom is about four people who aren't quite that rich at all, and are still living quite, you know, uh, paycheck to paycheck in rat mines, um, you know. So, and the central figure, the central character, Kevin Stokes, was loosely based on Stephen Stubbs, and um, so we got some great actors, you know, we got some brilliant actors, theatre actors, and like really great actors, Amy Kerwin. Um, and uh, you know, lots of great actors, and uh, Daryl Kinsella, and it was it was great fun. And we were RTE eventually. We made, basically sorry, we made our we made our own pilot episode, right? We actually made our own pilot episode. Me and Ray and friends and family, uh, we made our own show, uh, and gave it to RTE on a DVD. And um, amazingly, literally, I remember on a Friday afternoon, the DVD was given to Julian Vignols, the head of the head of entertainment. The head of entertainment, yeah, that was his, yeah. He was given the DVD on Friday, and on a Monday afternoon, he rang me and said, "Stephen, we have um, X amount to give you. We want two episodes, okay? By the end, by the end of the year. Now, the end of the year was two months away. So, two months is not a long time to do a, a two-part episode with a with a big budget, uh, thirty-eight speaking parts." Um, about 10 main characters 
Um, it's a bit, it was a big production, like, because it was a very fast moving show. It's still online somewhere, if you, if you want to watch it, called The Roaring Twenties. The Roaring Twenties, on YouTube somewhere. So, anyway, the point is, we said, yeah, we'll take that, Julian. Not at all. We just didn't realize, we never made a full, a big, big budget RT production before. And it's, it's, it's not the same as making stuff with your friends, because, first of all, the money just disappears, because actors get, have to get paid a certain amount, which is perfectly fine, because um, it's an RT production. So suddenly, a very large amount of money becomes a very small amount of money, you know? Um, so at the, at the end of it all, basically, me and Ray got paid very little, but it wasn't really about the money, because we were looking towards the, the full series. That was the main thing. We'll, we'll, we'll take it on the chin, make these first two episodes, and then we'll get the full season commissioned, and then we'll go wild then. And I, wrote, I, wrote, I had the, whole, the entire season written in prep, ready to go. Anyway, simultaneously to that, Kat, the Catherine Lynch show was also being made. So they're, they're making my show and Catherine Lynch's show. Um, I don't know if you know, you know Catherine Lynch? I do. Yeah, so she was making a kind of a chat show, kind of a spoof chat show, I think. Something like that, or you know, it's kind of a sketch show, chat show. And um, fair, and it was you know it was funny, it was good. And eventually, RTE said, "You know what, Stephen, we're going to go with Catherine Lynch's show, okay? Um, because uh, we just are." And uh, there was lots of other stuff going on, but I won't go into the details. But basically, Catherine Lynch, basically, her career kicked off from that from that point onwards, and she's still making stuff to this day for RTE, I think. Um, but you know, we learned a lot from that process, and um, I would write a book about it someday. Um, <laughs> Or maybe a sitcom. I might, I might write a sitcom about making of a sitcom. Because <laughs> it was funny. It was a funny kind of tragedy. And uh, then eventually after that, but we were then, in, and then fair play to RT, they, they came back to us looking for more ideas. You know? So the, one of the things about RTE is, um, RTE is not a perfect organization in any, any way. It's not a perfect organization. And the way they commission stuff is a little bit odd shall we say, but at least they were trying back then. In the late 90s or late noughties, they were trying to find new talent, you know, and they did. They found the Hardy books. The Hardy books came out of a thing called RT Storyland, which I, I was commissioned for as well, uh, two years in a row. Uh, okay, and the Hardy books were involved, uh, were commissioned, and they went on to become phenomenons, phenomenons, right? And um, so we... we uh, from that, we made a show called Mariana, a vampire kind of thing, a vampire show set, shot in Waterford. Do you remember Mariana? No, actually, that one. Really? No. Mm. I'll send you the link afterwards. If you type in Mariana RTE vampire on YouTube, it's the first, the, the first three episodes should still be up there somewhere. Yeah. So that was that was good. That was um, great. We had that. I, that was good fun. Um, we shot it all in Waterford. Um, I hired a big house in Williamstown and William Street for all the actors and crew to live in together. <laughs> and they had some wild nights, I tell you. But anyway, uh, so yeah, uh, we shot in the park. We shot all in the forum in the restaurant part. So yeah, I'll send you the link. Um, it's still one of the best things I've done, I think. Mm. Personally, so, I think the best thing you've done is David Clementine's Pour Am Wasted, personally. Yeah, so after my work with RTE dried up, um, and I worked in Fair City for a while, but that you know that was just um, I won't go into that too much because I did I wasn't really good at, it, you know. So um, I moved on from there. I, uh, I'm not really a, I'm not really a, a drama writer, shall we say? Um, so I moved on from there and came back to Waterford um, for a few reasons, and then eventually I started getting into music, which is something I hadn't really considered since I was a teenager because I was in a band when I was. In, I don't know, I was 16, I was in a, in a band with Tommy Farrell and, and uh, Anthony Brown and a few people. Um, so it was something, about, music, music is definitely my main passion other than comedy. So so somewhere in the, I don't know, eight years, seven years ago, eight years ago, I said, you know what, I want to kind of basically reinvent myself as a, this kind of a spoof pop star from the 80s kind of thing. Um, well, I'm quite sure of the details behind it, but you know, I just said, let's go with this. And let's just kind of basically, um, you know, like David Bowie or like, you know, these Elton John, they're creations, you know. You know, Elton John is not Elton John. He's Reg Dwight. 
David Bowie is David Jones, and so on and so on. They, they reinvented themselves. David Bowie reinvented himself multiple times before he became famous. You know, Ziggy Stardust was when he hit it big, but he has four or five albums before that where he's trying all kinds of different things. You know, folk music. He's then, you know, suddenly then he's doing psychedelic music and so on. And um, so what I'm saying is I kind of like the fact that artists can kind of reinvent themselves and create their own reality. I like that. You know, so I decided let's become this kind of 80s has been um, a pop star called David Clementine. And let's just go all the way, go all the way with it. As Bukowski says, uh, go all the way or don't go at all. Something like that. Go big or, go, or don't go. Yeah, something like that. This is go all the way, basically, as in go all in. So I went all in, which meant basically turning into David Clementine on Facebook for an entire year, I think, um, which I, I said to you earlier, that must have been extremely annoying to a lot of my, my friends, okay? Because I didn't really, I didn't explain to people what I was doing. I just started doing it. And so a lot of people were just a bit miffed, as, as in they didn't get the joke, which is fine. I, my, my comedy is quite niche, I think. Quite niche comedy. Um, well, a lot of comedy I like is niche. Like really, really, really niche. Like from like we haven't even gone into that. Like Vic and Bob, Vic Reeves and Bob Mortimer were my heroes. Monty Python, and um, there's American comedians called Tim and Eric, which have created their own universe. I love comedian a comedy that creates its own surreal universe, right? And uh, where it can be quite an in joke thing almost, you know. But once you're inside the once you're inside the joke, it's really compelling. Uh, so people who got who people who got the Clementine thing really enjoyed it. You know, <laughs> this handful of, of brave and good taste people, uh, like yourself. You I, know. I loved it. Like, genuinely, I loved everything you did there. I thought it was so inventive and witty and smart. It was a, a joke on life and despair, but it was done in such a smart, like, charismatic way. Mm. You embodied that personality and that persona so perfectly. To me, it was absolutely many things, but annoying wasn't one of them. I loved going to your live performances. I loved watching the videos. I loved to watch you lose yourself in character. I think for me personally, I think that's a beautiful quality for someone to be able to do. And ultimately, it doesn't matter if other people get it or not, but you definitely had a super fan. Yeah. In Brilliant. Thank you. I, I, I remember you uh, commenting on a lot of stuff he was doing and share and sharing stuff which is great you know because he was there was yeah he had his own official fan page i think uh it's still there his official fan page is still there it still gets likes and views now and then which must be baffling to people who just discover that page because yeah it's a bit hard to explain if you just come across that page what's going on there exactly um so yeah he, i think he, he even had his own little um celebrity kind of celebrity show at one point um david clementine's internet report show Hashtag to Dicker. <laughs> uh, T -T -R yeah. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, it was basically, he's a washed up kind of 80s star trying desperately to reinvent himself in the age of social media and making a total hames of it, basically. That was kind of the concept. And uh, he might come back someday. He was last seen in Beverly Hills in a, in a, in a treatment center. Okay. So he's still undergoing hypnotic uh, um, treatment for whatever ailments he has. So he might come back someday. But I have to lose about two stone because he was a bit lighter than I am now. Uh, but luckily, D Steve Brokeman is is my exact is my exact weight. <laughs> so Steve Brokeman basically is me. So that's great. So luckily, up we're coming straight up to um, up to present day, up to present day. Now, actually, about two years ago, I basically started a new project musically, a new musical project called Steve Brokeman. So Steve Brokeman is probably a bit more serious than the Clementine because in the intervening years, I actually learned it. Well, it, I learned it a little bit on guitar. So I've been writing songs on guitar using my four or five chords. You know, they say all you need is three chords and the truth. That's all you need. Well, I need about six. Um, and I've just progressed to the F chord, which is a really exciting chord, I must say. Um, when you master it. Uh, so uh, basically, yeah, I've always written songs, but only recently have I had an instrument that I can actually write on, which is amazing. So as you said earlier, it's, a, it's another string to your bow. You should have as many, if you're a creative person, you should, you should have as many strings to your bows 
as possible or quivers quivers in your whatever it's called um, um yeah why not you know some musicians might say who the fuck does he think he is releasing songs when he has four, only has four chords and uh, uh but why not you know <laughs> if you don't if you don't like it don't watch it that's you it know. there's an uh, audience you, for everything yeah. there's an audience for everyone i think if you're brave enough to create and reinvent constantly and run with your mad ideas that's half the battle you know i I've always really admired that quality in you personally. Like it's it's beautiful to watch someone so committed to character, so committed to, I guess, the madness in their mind. Uh, it's taken me yeah. years to commit to mine. So. <laughs> yeah, but um, you're comfortable. You're comfortable with it. You got to get comfortable with your madness. <laughs> create a creative madness. You know, creative madness. It's something to be embraced. Really, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, you have to be, um, you have to, you can't live your entire life worrying about other people's opinions. Otherwise, you get nothing done. You just get nothing done. I'm talking kind of creatively. I don't, I don't mean you have to be a complete asshole, you know. But I'm talking creatively. You have to just go with your gut instinct, whether it's doing online, an online chat show like this, or whether it's doing a you know, quiz cast, or whether it's doing, you know, music videos. Like music videos is something. Like, till the day I die, I will, every few months or so, I'll come out with a music video. Especially with David Clement, oh, sorry, uh, Steve Brokeman. He's a long-term project. I probably will do Steve Brokeman till the day I leave this planet, okay, for my next adventure. <laughs> Seriously, Brokeman's the kind of character who can just get old and big gray beard or something, and he lets become a blues singer or something, you know. So I have, low, I have a dozen songs in the pipeline for him in, only in, in this year. All that's holding me back now is the fact that I'm here in my house in Tremor and I can't really do anything. So as soon as things calm down, I have three or four songs this year coming out, big proper productions. I want to really step up the video productions of, of, their, of, his, of his songs, get real musicians on board, go into the studio like real musicians still, and um, start churning out some content. <laughs> Yeah, because it's good. And then eventually, at the end of this year, hopefully by the end of this year, I actually will do a live concert as Steve Brokeman, which I haven't done yet. I don't have I? I've done some open mics at him, but I haven't done a full-blown concert because I've got big ideas for the concert. It'll be an audiovisual experience, kind of like a, a retrospective of his career, something like that, you know? So uh, lots in store for him, um, hopefully this year. So, and uh, yeah, he released a song a couple of days ago called Love in, the, Love in a Time of Pandemic. Very simple song, guitar and me um, here in, in the sitting room, which I, I, I churned out recently. But I, I, originally I wanted to do a, a big production for that song. Then I realized, you know, I can't really do it. Um, so why, I said, so just don't, don't do the big production and just get the song out there right now, you know. Um, that's the thing. I'm not a perfectionist. This is the thing about me. I know artists who are perfectionists, okay? And yeah, when they release something, it's incredible and it's perfect. But the amount of time they put into it and sweat and tears, they could be maybe a year between their projects. And I, I just can't wait a year, okay? I can't wait a week, you know? So I, I from my point of view, I'd rather just keep throwing stuff out there you know and um but that's just the way i, I make stuff I, I i totally understand other people who basically want to get it a million percent right you know and just do it over and over and over and over and over and over again whether it's a film or, a, or an album even or anything like that so um but luckily the kind of stuff i make it doesn't really matter that much if it's rough around the edges but when i do start making songs when clementines are oh, sorry get mixed up between all the different people and Steve I'm also making a soap opera. Steve Brokeman, sorry. Because I'm also thinking of um, I'm making a new soap opera, a spoof soap opera soon called Turf Town. And I'm starting to think of their character names in my head as well. So anyway, um, Steve Brokeman, yeah. When he does start doing his new songs later in the summer, probably, they will be properly done. You know what I mean? They'll be actually in a studio with musicians. You know, because um, even this couple of songs he released last year, um, my, my, my Battered Heart, you know, that was done with real musicians. Obviously, I wrote the song on, on an acoustic guitar, but I brought it to professional musicians, uh, Lee Furnival, Mick, Michael Burke, genius guitar player, and they turned it into a pretty good sounding record, I think. Um, 
musically anyway, musically. Um, and a couple other things. Um, yeah, so, and that's, I want to do it that way. I, 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 would, I love going to actual musicians with a very simple four chord song and let them run with it and turn it into an actual real song. You know, that's fantastic because they will come up with new ideas. And I would never, I, I wouldn't even be, even be able to come up with because I'm not, I'm not really a musician. So, um, uh, yeah. So, but creative so types of all yeah. sorts kind of need to rely on each other for creativity. Like one of the most beautiful things I found out in one of the recent interviews was that a girl was very, very grateful for her producers. Sorry, my cat decided to join in. Um, so no I. No cat. Uh, Fraggy. Ooh, black cat. Nice. Mm. Yeah, I finally got a familiar. Well, he got me. He picked me. So. But yeah. Oh, you found you found him. Kind of. It's a really beautiful twist of fate story. I was looking for a black cat for quite some time. I had a feline that I loved dearly. About eight years ago, he passed away, and I was never brave enough to get another. And I started mm. looking for a black cat everywhere and I was playing a game of cat Tinder, I like to call it. Cat and Tinder. all the cats kept swiping the other way. And then one day I was um, doing my radio show and he, a friend of mine, or my cousin actually, tagged me in a picture of him and I text his owners. And it turns out I knew them, kind of, because the boy owner drinked in Arch all the time, so I was meeting him the whole time. And they were looking to rehome braggy who was then called pixie and mm. i was looking for an adult black cat so my toddler didn't torment him too much and we were really what? worried that he wouldn't get on with me or whatever but from day one mm. he hasn't left my side like he follows me everywhere he's actually me cat lack he's actually me boyfriend oh wow cool um yeah because they can be unusual animals uh, sometimes they can be very uh, sometimes they can be a bit aloof you know as pets but um yeah i've never had a cat myself um but i i know lots of friends with cats and they seem quite devoted to their cats they are very strange animals very very unusual creatures you can never tell what you can kind of tell what's happening in a dog's brain because <laughs> they're quite obvious in their emotions but with a cat you just can't tell you know which is kind of um that's kind of attractive, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, there's something yeah. nice about how free they are and how they just do their own thing, you know. I have a mm. dog too, but I wanted a cat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's the dog, um, what's it called? Dog called? Halley, which means hug and finish. Halley, yeah. Halley, I know Halley. I remember Halley. Halley must be old now, yeah? Yeah, she's going to be 10 in July. Wow. Fair play to Halley. Yeah. Is Halley named after Halley's, Halley's Comet? No, she's named Halley because it means hug in Finnish. And at the time I got her, I was going out with a Finnish fella. And oh. I was, she, all her commands are actually in Finnish. So she speaks dog Finnish. So if I want her to sit down or speak or give me the paw, it's all in Finnish. Interesting. That's handy to know. So in case you ever get another Finnish uh, boyfriend, you can order him around in actual proper language. You know, I believe I don't always paw. need to be verbal when <laughs> I'm ordering paw. men around. <laughs> give me the paw. Give me the paw. <laughs> yeah. Men love being ordered around. They love it. They love it. Uh, in, in small portions. Um, anyway, we're straying from the point now. We're straying from what we're talking about now. <laughs> Deep Rope Man, yeah, Deep Rope Man. And so check out his Facebook page. The summer. Yeah, I have lots of stuff planned for him. Um, just, just literally waiting, just waiting to for normality to return. We can actually meet up with musicians again, you know. So, um, yeah, um, yeah. So people, if, you, if people aren't aware of Steve Rope Man, please type in Steve Rope Man into your Facebook search engine and give his page a like. Thank you very much. Um, now just for uh, so yeah, hmm? personal, my own personal curiosity on this one. What endears you more to Steve Brokeman than any other character you've had? Because you've already decided that he's going to be a lifetime devotion yeah. project to you. So, what is it about him specifically 
that makes you go, oh yeah, um, you're a lifer? I don't know, you know, uh, I don't know, it, it might sound a bit, I don't know, it's just, it might sound a bit pretentious, but um, when I'm thinking, when I'm thinking like Steve Brokeman, you know, and he's not a million miles away from me, <laughs> right, he's got a better beard, he had an amazing beard a couple of years ago, which I, you know, but um, what I'm saying is, you know, when I'm thinking like him, as in how would Steve Brokeman write a song about the pandemic, right, Stephen Stubbs mightn't write a song similar to it but when i'm thinking when i'm thinking like he would think suddenly the song has just come right and um, so that song a couple of days ago i wrote that in one day pretty much uh maybe two days and i was struggling to think of i was struggling to think of that song until i said how would steve broatman write that song if he was marooned in his sitting room with a guitar and a few bottles of wine how would he write a little kind of folk song about the pandemic as if it was written years later that's something i like when i'm writing a song i kind of like how would this song be written years later okay so like a protest song like in the 60s people were writing pro protest songs and uh, in, in real time you know so i was kind of thinking like that as in let's write a folk song like a kind of a, a folk uh, song about the pandemic as if it was written in the 1960s by bob dylan or something like that you know what i mean What's happening now? Um, like the David Clementine song about Facebook, right? That was like, what, what would happen if a 1980s pop star wrote a song about Facebook in the 80s, which didn't exist then, but you know what I mean? Uh, do you? <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? It's like, it's kind of, kind of lateral thinking, you know? And um, so that's how um, the Baroque Man thing happens. So it, I, just like, I just like doing it, basically. It gives me... It gives me creative pleasure um, to just inhabit his mind space. Um, and it just, yeah, it just, it kind of, um, it's like playing a character, you know? You're much more comfortable playing a character sometimes. If you're doing comedy or something, um, it's just, it just flows easier if you're playing it as a character. Because it kind of unlocks, it kind of frees your mind, you know? You can kind of, basically hide yourself under this new veneer um and so and plus it's like having a cup of coffee or a, cup, a glass of wine it, it it opens your mind a little bit or whatever you know it literally opens your mind a little bit so yeah so i have a lot i have a lot planned for him because as he gets older as i get older you know he'll become like a, a musician in his late 40s or whatever and then like from springsteen to you know whatever elton john or elvis costello Paul Weller, Christina Aguilera, Britney, as they get older, they change. Madonna, right? <laughs> like, would you have imagined Madonna at 60 would be doing what she's doing now? I didn't think she would go like that at all, right? If you told me 20 years ago, because I grew up with Madonna. Madonna was as much part of my life as the Doors or anything like that, that I grew up with. You know, the Doors was a huge part of my childhood, even though they're 20 years previously, but you know what I mean? Then Pearl Jam and all that kind of stuff and Nirvana. But for me, Madonna was just as big, right? Even though I never, I never bought one of her records, but my sisters had Madonna all around the house, posters and CDs. So I was constantly listening to Madonna. And, you know, as a young man, I was young, whatever I was, a teenager, I was like, wow, she's hot, right, as well, you know. So that was also important. And I remember specifically the Immaculate Conception album cover is just mind-blowing for a 13-year-old boy. Um, and that was all over my house in the in, 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 on the walls and you know my sister's walls covered madonna so the point i'm making to you is i thought madonna's career because obviously i i realized she's about 20 years older than me which is scary jesus yeah she is yeah she is 18 years older than me so i thought she would morph into a kind of um diana ross type diva right in her in her 50s and 60s the way Diana Ross morphed into this beautiful, like Tina Turner even, well, maybe not so much Tina, but Diana Ross, just, when she wasn't in her 20s anymore, or even in her 30s, just became a kind of a soul pop singer, right? Wearing lovely gowns and stuff, <laughs> right? I thought Madonna would end up looking like that in her 60s, wearing lovely gowns and singing beautiful ball love ballads, right? I didn't think she'd be still dressed in her knickers, 
um, and her yoga pants um, jumping around the place with kind of Euro pop, Euro rave tunes going on. And why not? But, you know, that's the way, that's the way she's chosen to go, which is fantastic for her, you know. Um, so I love that. I love the, tra tra the, tra the trajectory of an artist's career as to where they will go. Like Bob, that's why I'm fascinated by Bob Dylan. Because Bob Dylan has had, you could write, you know, Bob Dylan had so many different incarnations, even though it's still Bob Dylan, you know, there's the, there's the, there's the little skinny teenager folk singer, Bob Dylan, living in a, in a, in a hovel in, in Greenwich Village, singing protest songs, you know, and doing Woody Guthrie covers. Then you have, then he went electric in the mid sixties, becomes this superstar called Bob Dylan, Basically, he's, he's expelled from the folk scene for plugging, plugging his guitar in. So he becomes a rock star, Bob Dylan. And then he, then he says, fuck that, not interested anymore. Disappears for four years, lives in a house in Woodstock and just raises his family. And he's not even in his late 20s yet. He's already gone through all the whole process. And then in the early 70s, then he, then he starts doing country and western albums. Like John Wesley Harding, that album, which is brilliant. And Nashville, uh, Nashville Sunrise or something it's called. Uh, Nashville Skyline. Just beautiful country and western albums. And suddenly he's got a different voice. He literally has a different vo vocal tone. So it doesn't even sound like Bob Dylan. Listen to his listen to Nashville Skyline, 1969, I think. It doesn't sound like Bob Dylan. And um, then he vanishes another couple of years. Then he goes back. Then he suddenly announces, I'm going on a, I'm going on a world tour again. And then he releases two or three of his best ever albums in the mid seventies, um, Desire and um, Blood in the Tracks and so on. And he's suddenly this basically like a Bruce Springsteen type character in the mid seventies, you know, kind of hard rock and still writing these epic long songs like Hurricane about social issues and stuff. And um, looking incredible, like wearing face paint and massive hats, <laughs> you know, and that's just the seventies. And then, he, then, he, then in the late seventies, he becomes a born again Christian, right? And he's a Jew, by the way, a Jew, right? So it's very, very rare for a Jew to become a Christian. Okay, very, very rare. And then um, suddenly in the late 70s, he goes, you know what, I'm a Christian now. And he starts releasing like gospel albums, you know, and so on, and, and you know, Christian rock, I, I suppose they call it as well. Uh, and so on and so on and so on and so on. So I just love the way Dylan, that's why Dylan's endlessly fascinating. And he, he released a song about two weeks ago about the assassination of JFK. In the middle of what's happening, Bob says, you know what, I released um, a 17 minute song about JFK. <laughs> right, and, it's, and, it's, and yet it somehow works. It somehow is relevant to what's happening, you know, because it's actually about the 60s, that song. It, it's about JFK's assassination, then this evolves into a kind of um, a treatise or a thesis on the 60s in general, and kind of the lost dream of the 60s. Which was he, he was a big part of. It's weird. It's weird hearing him singing about the six, with the lost promises of the sixties, because he was one of the biggest big, figures in the sixties, hopes and dreams, you know. And a lot of the folk people, the lot of folk stars in the sixties, have never have never forgiven him for uh, turning his back on folk music, because they saw him as their Christ-like figure, as the the great protest singer, who would lead us all to freedom through folk music, which was never going to happen anyway. <laughs> so they've never really forgiven him for that. But anyway, I'm sure he doesn't give a shit about it. He's moved on, you know. And that's just the main point. You've got to keep moving, you know. Uh, you got to keep on moving, like a Rolling Stone, which is one of his songs. See, that's what that's about. Anyway, so what the hell are we talking about? Uh, Bob Dylan, hmm. yeah. It's good. It's good. Yeah. It's good. It's all good. Um, but yeah, you're correct. The reinvention of self, the constant growth, the constant change, the, 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 the very thing that we talked about at the very beginning of this interview and the very thing that you reiterate constantly is the importance of realizing that things are ever moving and ever changing and to go with them as mm. opposed to going against them, which I fervently believe is one of your bigger qualities mm. in life and that ability to have self-belief in a character. And that was what I was curious about. I was like, why is Steve the one that resonates most with you? And you answered that perfectly. So that's all I wanted to know. I usually ask mm. a few questions surrounding music. Um, so usually the first question I ask anyone is, what was the first song you fell in love with? How you interpret that question is completely up to you. <laughs> How I interpret it? Uh, 
the first song I fell in love with. Um, okay, I have to try and get my dates. It's kind of difficult in because in, in the mists of time, things get kind of blurry. But I suppose I wasn't really that interested into music. See, I grew up in the 80s, okay? So I had to watch Top of the Pops, right? 80s Top of the Pops. I, I, we're talking 85 to 89. Probably the worst era for uh, Top of the Pops, in my opinion. Anyway, it was, it was a, yeah, a lot of terrible music. Stock Aiken and Wartman, you know, a lot of dross was being produced. Making lots of money, but um, it wasn't very musically interesting. So I kind of grew up watching that. Um, kind of, you know, because, you know, we had one television in the house, so I had, I had to watch it. My teenage sisters were watching it, so I had to watch it. But so I was like, I was, you know what, I wasn't really interested in it. I was more interested in like uh, dinosaurs and archaeology and um, and films and stuff. But then I suppose the big change was, it must have been The Doors. The Doors, Jim Morrison, you know. It must have been. It must have been 1990. Yeah, the film was released in 1990. Okay, so I was 13. I was 12 going on 13. And The Doors, Oliver Stone film was released, okay? And a friend of mine, Billy, was big into The Doors. And um, he had all the cassette tapes. I had nothing. He had all the cassette tapes, right, of The Doors albums. So they were like, they were like mystical artifacts, you know? He, had, he actually had the tapes. For, he only had six albums. The Doors only have six studio albums. So each of them was an amazing, as I said, like a, like a, a, a relic from the ancient past that I, I suddenly had. because he, he, he copied them for me. So I have to say thanks to Billy Higgins, if you're watching Billy. Thanks for um, introducing me to The Doors. Because that kind of changed things for me. Because then I suddenly realized the power of music. Now, I was, I was always, you know, I think simultaneously I was, I was obsessed with Simon and Garfunkel. Yeah, it was all, all happening in the same year. It was The Doors and Simon and Garfunkel, right? <laughs> um, actually, as I'm thinking of it, I think my love of writing lyrics came from Simon, Paul Simon first. Okay, because Paul Simon has incredible is an incredible lyrics writer, um, in his classic songs, The Boxer and um, Homeward Bound, Homeward Bound, right? Homeward Bound. Sorry, my Waterford accent came out there. Um, what an amazing lyric writer he is. He says so much in such a small space, you know. And um, so I remember, I remember writing out like, I remember trying to write Simon and Garfunkel songs in school. I had no interest really in school. I actually love Double Study. Double study because I just I could just write made up lyrics or write I used to draw comic books, so that's yeah that's it now as I come to think of it I used to write basically it was me doing an impression of a Paul Simon song that's what I was doing yeah and then the doors came along and then I kind of I realized the the the, the power the power of the theatrics of music because if you ever seen Jim Morrison perform it's it's pure theater you know it's dark it's weird you know. And this is before heavy metal. This is before Alice Cooper and all that kind of stuff. See, I used to I used to bore people to tears at parties, explaining to them why Jim Morrison is probably the most important, one of the most important artists of the 20th century. He's up there with Bob Dylan and Elvis, okay, and Janis, um, uh, Johnny Mitchell, who's huge, okay, massive. Johnny Mitchell is an incredible artist, and she doesn't get her. I don't think Johnny Mitchell gets her her Jews, as they say. Is it Jews? Yeah, she doesn't get her just... Joni Mitchell should be, should be mentioned with Bob Dylan and all that, but she isn't that much, unfortunately. Um, but there aren't that many female um, artists who are not influenced by Joni Mitchell, uh, musically anyway. Um, like Joni Mitchell was doing stuff that no other female was doing in the early 70s and late 60s. Incredible. re, -re to them albums. Um, and like the hissing, of, the hissing of Green Lawns and Hijira, those albums, incredible, right? Anyway, so, um, Paul Simon, yeah, Jim. So Jim kind of, I realized with Jim Morrison and The Doors, how powerful music could be when it's done. It's basically like filmmaking almost. It combines, it almost becomes like a, um, a visual performance. Um, and Jim Morrison, remember, Jim Morrison was a film student, you see? So I think, this, I think Jim knew what he was doing. Uh, Jim was in, in UCLA. Uh, film college in LA um, before he became a you know rock star and he was he was making short films really weird short films that still exist to this day and um, and he kind of he realized the power of the kind of uh, the Superman he wrote read a lot of Nietzsche Nietzsche speaks about the Superman now, unfortunately 
the Nazis also read Nietzsche, and a lot of Nietzsche is in um, the Nazi movement. But Jim wasn't a Nazi, right? But he learned about the theatrics of power, right? And think about it, what is a rock star? A rock star basically is a god on stage, right? That you worship for an hour or two hours, right? So Jim learned the power of that. So he, used to, you know, he, he said, you know, I, I want to look good on stage. I want the big hair. I want to have leather pants. I want to have great shirts. And I want to basically entertain my audience. I want to jump around the stage and collapse. And some songs, in one of his songs called The Unknown Soldier, Robbie Krieger, the guitar player, shoots him with the guitar. And Jim falls, drops dead. And people thought he had really fallen over and died sometimes. So not that many people were doing that kind of stuff in the, mid in the late 60s. Not that many performers were doing that, you know. The idea of the central rock god on stage was, was a brand new concept. Like the Beatles were a group. The Beatles were four people, right? Um, then Jim Morrison and Mick Jagger, you know, Janis Joplin, I suppose, as well. They become the central figure to be worshipped, you know, for, this, for an hour or two on stage. And that was a, that was a new concept. Now, obviously, Elvis, Elvis kicked it all off, of course, 10 years previously. But you know what I mean? The idea of the modern rock god, in my mind, was invented by Jim Morrison. Now, some would say it was Mick Jagger first, but I still think the modern rock god, the dark and dangerous rock god, is, is Jim Morrison. It's the original. Anyway, so that's how I got into music. It was Jim Morrison and Paul Simon. And then I got obsessed with Bjork. Big time. Still am, really. Um, still holding out for Bjork. If you're watching Bjork, I'm still available. Uh, so, uh, she's... Uh, no, Big Time Sensuality was one of the first albums. Uh, no, sorry, Debut. Debut is one of the first albums I bought with my own money. And the first single I ever bought was Big Time Sensuality. In 92 or 3, I think. Even before grunge music, I was into Bjork. Um, and then I, got into, and I obviously got into Nirvana and Pearl Jam and so on. I was, I was actually more of a Pearl Jam head than a Nirvana head, to be honest. Especially the album 10, which is a total masterpiece. I agree with every single thing you've named there. So that's perfect. Great. Well, to be honest, you have covered so much today. I really think that we managed to capture your magic very well. Um, thank you very much for the conversation. I would urge absolutely everyone who's watched this video to get to know this man better. And I recommend doing so by tuning into the quiz cast on a Wednesday night at 10 ish or on a Saturday night at 10 ish. You will find that on Stub Vidi Stubbs Vid Media. Stubbs Vid Media. Stubbs Vid Media. <laughs> that, that is yeah. a hard to say. Stubbs Vid Media, yeah. It's, getting, it's got nothing to do with COVID, COVID, right? That's just a coincidence, right? Um, but um, yeah, so yeah, Stubbs Vid Media. I try and do the quizzes every Wednesday and, and Saturday night at 10 p.m. ish, ish, ish. Okay, but usually it's between 10 and midnight or later so yeah we'll keep on going with the quiz cast until at least the 5th of may i believe the lockdown is is currently scheduled to end on the 5th of may right so I, that's my kind of um my, my provisional end date for these particular quizzes but in the long term I, I will be doing the quizzes probably on a much bigger scale when i move to a new location and basically set up a new studio somewhere and cause at the moment i'm doing this basically in a sitting room so but I think there is big potential in regular quiz casts with, with prizes. This is something maybe we haven't mentioned. There, I'm not just, it's not just for fun. I'm actually giving away prizes. I'm a big believe, I love giving away stuff to people. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm very much of a giver, right? <laughs> Seriously. So Saturday night's show, we've given away about 200 quid worth of vouchers in the last month, okay? And by we, I mean I. No, but, but Saturday night, but now what's happened is fantastically, People like John the Bromhead have contacted me in Downs' pub and he gave us a free bottle of uh, number nine whiskey. So that was given away on Saturday night show, Hazy Lake. Hazy Lake won that. And, on, and then Harry O'Neill contacted me from Momo. Momo, which you know very well. Momo Restaurant. And they have offered us another voucher um, for Momo. And that will be given away on Saturday night show. So this is good. This is kind of evolving. And this is, kind of, this is the way I'd like it to go where it's not just, you know, it's, it's businesses can kind of advertise their own uh, businesses, I suppose, and offers with vouchers and stuff. Because gift vouchers are the best way to do it, really. This is something I've noticed online. 
it's an easier way to do it for prize winnings. It's just to be able to email someone about the picture and they can just, you know, use it whenever they want. So I think in the long run, there's, there is a lot of potential in, in, in online quizzes, you know, and it's also a bit of crack as well, you know, um, hopefully anyway. It's Which great fun. Crack. Your themes are great fun. I'm loving all the mini sitcoms. I'm loving the little cuts with you and the bear yeah. with me moments. You know what I mean? You're funny. I bear with me. <laughs> I still can't understand why you haven't just like to me it just doesn't make sense because I find you just fascinating like I've made many enemies Rebecca you see <laughs> I'm not well liked in the, in the Irish uh, media industry but who cares what you do is what the great thing about Facebook or um, the modern world is you can carve out your own little ecosystem as I call it um, you can just carve out your own little ecosystem where you could have two or three hundred fans and that's it that'll do you you know um, and people with Patreon, there's artists now being funded by two or three hundred Patreons every month. Like Blind Boy has a few thousand Patreons now. You know, that's paying his rent. You know, um, that's what I mean. You know, so, you know, I'm nowhere near that at the moment. But, you know, hopefully down the line, I could maybe, you know, uh, get somewhere. Um, I, as long as I can pay my rent, I'm happy, you know. You know, I've been all around the world multiple times. Um, I've seen the world, it's a beautiful world. So now I just want to concentrate on, um, on creating good content. Because I think a, a, an artist, this might sound potentious or pretentious. Is potentious a word? word? Pretentious. Pretentious is a word, but is it portentious is another word that's similar. And I, it's, it's my, this might sound portentious, but I think the great, a great tragedy is an artist who doesn't utilize his talent, right? And lets it waste and wither on the vine, right? I know a lot of much more talented people than me who did not fulfill their potential, okay? Now, for multiple reasons. I won't go into why, but they all have their own reason as to why they didn't fulfill it, you know? Um, so I think that's a, it's a tragedy if you, don't, if you don't make the most of what you have uh, talent-wise, talent you know? Even if you're not even that talented, <laughs> you know, even if, you know, I mean, who are we to judge? But in the modern world, it is possible to carve out a little, a little, a little universe for yourself, I think, you know, and just about get by. Um, I know so many comedians who are doing it. They've carved out, you wouldn't even know their names, and they've carved out a career for themselves online, you know. So, yeah, I have loads, I have a, I have a book, this, I have a notepad this high of ideas. So I just, have, I just hope I live long enough in the next 10, 20 years to get it all out of my system. And I, I'd be happy. Not interested in riches or anything like that. It's just to get my, my, my ideas from pe page to screen, I suppose. And now my music as well, which is great. I mean, this, the, the, the fact that I'm now, if you had told me two or three years ago that I'd be singing songs with an acoustic guitar, I wouldn't have believed you because I, I, I'm, I wouldn't, I'm not able, I'm not actually, I'm still kind of a, I'm still kind of introverted, I suppose, and, and performing live is not something I really enjoy doing that much. But that's why, I mean, one on one, like open mics, the open mic stuff we were doing recently, that is scarier, much scarier than to me than doing online quiz casts and stuff, you know. And um, that was quite, that's quite scary stuff, in my opinion. So, but with anything, with anything in life, the more you do it, the easier it gets, I suppose. So that's why I would love to do a Steve Brokeman as an actual live concert. Uh, later in the year or maybe next year who knows where we'll be uh, in a few months time because that will be on a big scale i love overblown music productions like you know um just over the top and there'll be a storyline going through it as well it, it'll be uh, i won't go into too much but it, it'll be quite it'll be it'll be big it won't be subtle it won't be subtle i don't do subtle <laughs> I'd be quite familiar with that myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, yeah, exactly. As I said, go big or don't go at all. Um, well, yeah. look, thanks but, so much for your time. Um, everyone should be watching the quiz cast and everyone should be tuning in to what's happening next with Steve Brokeman. Before I go, mm -hmm. is there anything you'd like to add to the interview, Stephen? Uh, I don't know. Is there anything you'd like to say about uh, what's happening with your show in the future? Viking Promotions, in case anyone doesn't know, Viking Promotions is a website, well, it's a Facebook page and you dedicated to the, uh, 
promotion of local music. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. good music all around, actually, not just local. And I kind yeah. of inherited a brand uh, back in February because there is absolutely no way I would have started my own company at this era of my life. But here we are. So what I've been doing is constantly trying to reinvent myself. And when this pandemic happened, I started small with buying three band t-shirts every week to make sure the scene was still going. Today, I decided to send uh, one euro to five different people on their, um, you know those cards, what are they called, Revolut? So they could buy a track from their favorite artist in order to support the scene that way. And then the interviews just happened kind of organically. And that's just been happening. What's happening next? Oh, that's very interesting. And we, you obviously know, but we'll see where that goes too. Looks like I accidentally land myself in these um, these uh, these these beautiful potential scenarios the way you do too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, as I say, we we have to, it is we are kind of in a holding pattern at the moment, so it's, it is hard to make plans. But I mean, I think things. I think I think by uh, mid summer or late summer, things will have opened up a little bit. I think they have to really, otherwise the economy will collapse um, even more so. So yeah. So now is the time to plan stuff, you know, as in put some thought into these ideas. So we're ready for when the world reopens like a flower. Mm. And what a beautiful flower it will be for all the butterflies that just left the cocoon. Hope so. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> right, That's I'll it. The world, the, place. the world is a beautiful place. The world is what you make of it. I will mm. stop recording. Oh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and follow this online. <laughs>